night I uh, laid uh, I sat out on a porch and laid in bed even listening to the fireworks going off around our house and I know it was a celebration for a lot of people but it also reminded me as I heard the thunder and the sounded like cannons that the freedom we have was not so free it cost a great deal for this nation so today I want to celebrate what a great country we live in. We live in a great country. God has blessed us. And we need to celebrate that, rejoice in it, and do everything we can to preserve the freedoms for others. And let's today read out of Psalms 8. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens through the praise of children and infants. You have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? As we 
celebrate today, let us remember the great price that our eternal freedom was purchased with. And we have a freedom unlike any man because of Jesus Christ. Let's worship and celebrate it. You are here. You're moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. You're moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. You're working in this place. Thank you. I worship you. I worship you. You are the waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are the waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are here, touching everything.
towards you that others may follow in that way. God, because you are a miracle worker. And we just thank you and pray in the name of Jesus. Will you sing that chorus with me? We make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are the we make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light darkness, my God, that is who you are. Even when I don't, even, even when, when I, I don't see that you're working, even though I don't feel that you're working, you never stop, you never stop working, you never stop, you never stop working, even when I don't see that you're working, even when I don't feel that you're working, you never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see that you're working. Even when I don't feel that you're working. You never stop. No, you never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. When you make a miracle work, a promise keeps light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Yes. that many are the plans of a man's heart. Many are the plans of a man's heart. But your plan, God, your plan is what will prevail. God, you are sovereign. You are sovereign and you are in control of all things. God, it seems as though that this world is just chaos. But you're in control of it all. And you are working, God. You are working and you are causing your people to come to you and, and kneel at you, Father. For every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that you are Lord. You are our leader. And we follow you and we worship you, Jesus. God, we thank you for all of the men and the women that have sacrificed their lives so that we can have the freedoms that we have, God. And may we not... May we not sit back. God, may we stand for the truth of your word. God, help us to filter out all the lies that we hear, God, and stand on your truth, your truth alone, Jesus. And we thank you ultimately for your sacrifice so that we can have spiritual freedom and no one, no one can take that from us, Lord. 
Nothing can separate us from your awesome love. God, we thank you. Let me praise you, Jesus. Hide me now under
We truly are blessed. You know, the Word of God tells us as we prepare for our giving today, a time of giving and special music, uh, that we are to bring the full tithe into the house, that there may be food in my house, the Word of God says. All you do is read the book of Malachi. It talks about how we're robbing God in tithes and offerings. You've been a very faithful congregation, and I appreciate it so much. But we want to continue in that. Today, we encourage you as we enter into a time of giving, that you can do that through giving in service, through our Alexio app, through text. You can find the, e the mailing address on our website. And uh, we hope that you'll continue and pray that you're going to continue to give because it's God's will for you to do that. And it's God's will for us to be faithful with he, what he's blessed us with. We're going to ask Danny Tiska to play us a special song as we prepare a time of giving. You may be seated. Man, I can't believe he can do that. <laughs> We're having a very exciting day today as we welcome our new pastor, Pastor Matt Close. 
and his wife and kids would you all come down i'd like for some of the elders to come down and um, have time of prayer for them as we dedicate them to the lord this morning and uh so we're very excited about them coming and being with us come on down Just kind of gather behind them and put your hands on their shoulders. So good to have you here. And uh, this is Pastor Matt Close. Let's give him a round of applause. Welcome him. Yep. And uh, Matt, would you introduce your family uh, to sure. us all? This is uh, our oldest daughter, Lila. She's 11 years old, going into sixth grade. Uh, Leland, he's our youngest. He's five, uh, going into kindergarten. Uh, on the end is uh, Josiah, our middle child. He's, he'll be nine years old in two days, um, and he's going into third grade. And um, my better three quarters, uh, Sarah, is more than a half, so three fourths. Um, yeah. I don't know. I guess I, I said her age in the first service. I didn't know if I was allowed to do that or not. No, we're both, we're both 36 years old, uh, and we've been married for 14 years as of four days ago so we just celebrated our anniversary amen well we're thankful to have you join us would you all stand we're going to have a time of prayer for them uh you know the, i was thinking about this time of dedication and uh recognition and and uh i was remembering in chapter 13 of the book of acts when paul and barnabas were seeking god's direction in their ministry and the church had prayed over them and uh so after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Well, we're sending them not off, but right here. You know, we've got a lot of work to do together, and we're excited about you all being a part of the team and uh, excited about your whole family being here. We're a, we're a family-oriented church. That's what we're going to continue to be. So we're going to have a word of prayer for you. Let's, let's lay our hands on. Father God, we thank you for the privilege of dedicating Matt and Sarah and the family. We pray, Lord God, that you would just bless them as they take on these great responsibilities to encourage the young families and the children and the people of our church. We thank you, Father, for the gifts and talents we witness in Matt's life and ministry. We pray, Lord, that we would help them as they raise their family to be an encouragement to them but also that we would link arms together to see your will done in the creating of ministries and sustaining of ministries, that your will be done. Help us, Lord, to have an even greater passion to reach outside the walls of this church to see your will done. And, Lord, we love you. We commit them to you, and we welcome them, and we dedicate them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Be sure to extend a welcome to them as they are joining us in ministry. Thank you, Matt. Matt, stay here. <laughs> and Matt is going to assume his new duty of reading Scripture for us. We're in Acts chapter 3 this morning, reading verses 11 through 20. While the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. And when Peter saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we have made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. And you handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. And you disowned the holy and the righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life. But God raised him from the dead. And we are witnesses of this. By faith, in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he foretold through all the prophets saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent then and turn to God 
so that your sins may be wiped out and that times of refreshing may come from the Lord and that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. It's the word of God. Please be seated. Can you be seated? We are in a series of messages on, uh, really we've been following this since, tracking with it since the uh, crucifixion and resurrection uh, Easter season we have been tracking then with the events that followed Christ's resurrection and ascension and we are in the third chapter of the book of Acts and we're going to look at chapter 3 part of it today and then chapter 4 next week as we continue on and I'm titling this little mini series of four ch- sermons or three or four sermons here the li- let the lion out of the cage <laughs> this is part two of it and uh, last week we looked at the beginning uh, uh, looked at the healing of a lame man at the gate called beautiful let's begin with prayer dear holy dear father heavenly father we thank you that we can gather together we thank you for those who are watching on live stream and we pray lord that the church would continue to grow and blossom in this community and shed your light not only here but not only locally but globally and we pray lord god that your holy spirit would be welcome here today to speak to our hearts to uh, encourage us in our faith walk to have a trust in you and i pray father that we would not only trust you but that we would act upon the faith that you've given us in jesus precious name we pray amen well last week we looked at the healing of the lame man at the gate called beautiful and it was a beautiful gate because it was made of corinthian bronze and it was just beautiful but it took on a new beauty that day the lame man was healed because there's extraordinary unbelievable beauty in the miracles of god and i thank god for his ministry our key verse for this series is then peter said silver or gold i do not have but what i have i give to you in the name of jesus christ of nazareth walk the power is in the name of jesus i told the illustration of charles spurgeon uh, about defending a, a lion they had in a cage and one can imagine how an army would gather around a cage and would be protecting the lion and he likened that to how many times men write books about the authority of God's word, defending the uh, inerrancy of God's word? He said, really, uh, what we need to do is let the lion out of the cage because the lion can defend itself. And really what he's talking about there is the proclamation of the good news. Uh, Instead of sitting around arguing the authority of Scripture and the uh, inspiration of Scripture and all that, tell people the good news of jesus now i'm not against those books i've been reading one really have been encouraged by uh the book i've been reading in reference to the authority of scripture and the uh inerrancy of scripture but there's some truth to the fact that when we let the message of christ ring out from our hearts it's powerful in of itself we don't need to defend christ he is he is our great great savior we noted the brokenness of people in Christ's day, a man lame from birth, begging at a gate called beautiful, totally dependent upon others to meet his need, living on the generosity of visitors that would travel through the temple. Peter and John, that day, when they heard his cry, and by the way, I just have to encourage you to listen for the cry. Because there's people out there who are broken. Marriages that are broken. Children who are being neglected and abused. Kids who are going hungry. I heard a testimony of someone who was at Royal Family Kids Camp and they were just overwhelmed by the reality of what they saw and witnessed in the brokenness of these children. We can't forget that, folks. They're all around us. And sometimes we just grow dull. We don't hear it. How many thousands of people walked past that man in all those years he lay there? Maybe they threw a few coins at him. Maybe they nodded at him. Maybe they even smiled at him. But that day, 
but have eternal ramifications for him. Peter and John chose to connect with him. And as he was walking by and they cried out for a few coins, begging there, they turned and gave him their full attention. If you remember, it was a solid gaze. They were connected to him at that moment. And as Peter reached out his hand and helped him up, you know, silver and gold, we don't have what we have. We give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth's walk. And he helped him up. The man was instantly strengthened. As he goes out of that, 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 that point, he goes into the temple, jumping and praising and celebrating. And as a result, it says in Acts 3, 9 through 10, when all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened. What we have here is the power of confession. The apostles confessed Jesus as they called upon his name for the healing. They not only professed his name, but they reached out in faith, taking him by the hand and lifting him up, and instantly he was healed. The man confessed Christ, or the power of God, as he shouted the praises of God. He knew that this miracle had happened to him, and he's jumping and praising God and, and, and hollering and shouting the good news of what's happened to him. The crowds, I believe in a way, confessed the power of God as they gathered around him in amazement and wonder. They knew that good things come from God. They also know that bad things come from the devil. This is a good thing. A man that they'd walked past year after year, day in and day out, going there to pray and have a time of worship, they saw him now whole and celebrating life. All of this opened the door for Peter to let the lion out of the cage, so to speak. The lion of Judah as he shared the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And the first thing we observe in our text is Peter confronts their amazement. Peter shares the message with the crowd, this crowd that had been gathered. While the beggar held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished, came running to the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, men of Israel, why does this surprise you? Now notice, first of all, his identification with them he says men or fellow israelites men of israel men just like us why does that surprise you you should know the truth the truth is that which will make you free and the freedom comes in knowledge that this is not of us peter and john are connecting as fellow jews we are in this together we are celebrating we are participating in the final culmination of god's salvation history he corrects their faulty thinking. Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we made this man walk? He's correcting them. He's keeping the focus on Jesus. Uh, John and Peter are not the source of this man's healing. And, and, which brings us to a vital point. The Spirit-filled church, a church is going to walk in the path of Christ has always got to keep the focus on Jesus. God's servants, we are God's servants, every one of us. We are called to do a job. We are the dolos, the committed ones of Christ. But it's not about us. It's about Christ. It's about what Christ has done. And we have to keep that focused. And they disavow any power within themselves to evoke this healing. It has come through Jesus and Jesus Christ alone why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we have made this man walk peter gives the glory to jesus he says the god of abraham isaac jacob the god of our fathers has glorified his servant jesus in other words as jesus has been faithful and as you remember what jesus said i brought you just before he leaves this earth he says i brought you glory on this earth Father, now return that glory that I'd given up. He'd left everything in heaven to come here for us. And now the Father is glorifying the name of Jesus, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the God of our fathers. In other words, he says, go back to your history books. Look and see what it says. Do you remember? I was actually thinking about this. Do you remember what God promised Abraham when he told him he'd make him a great nation? All people on the earth will be blessed through you, Abraham. 
And that blessing came through the resurrected Christ who defeated death for all of us. So Jesus has come, and there's healing here. He gives the glory to God. At the initial healing, Peter had called on the name of Jesus. In other words, Peter and John are walking into the temple. They're in that broad way. People probably passing behind, behind them. They turn. They connect with that man laying there. They reach out their hand. They call upon the name of Jesus, and he's healed. He heard that. Peter and John knew that that had happened. But the people who come storming to them <laughs> didn't know what this was all about. So he gives Peter and John a springboard to go further with the message, a message that the crowd was not aware of, but they hear him clearly give the glory to Christ. So in summary of the first part of this message, Peter is giving all the glory and power to Jesus Christ. He's making it clear that Jesus is fulfillment of all that the prophets and the patriarchs of the Jewish faith had anticipated. If you go to other places in Scripture, it talks about how they had killed and, and tortured the prophets that brought these messages. And yet they knew they were there. And it blows my mind that they did not know enough Scripture to identify that the Messiah had come. It's written throughout all the Scriptures. It's intertwined there in the passages. So... He is making it clear that Jesus is a fulfillment of all the prophets and the patriarchs and the Jewish faith had anticipated. Let me say this. We need to hear this loud and clear. All wholeness is found in Christ Jesus. All wholeness is found in Christ Jesus. Oh, people have an experience here, they have an experience there, and they're happy for a while, but true wholeness is found in Jesus. He is the one who takes us to new heights. He is the one who shows us his glory, who shows us, have, gives us an anticipation of his glory that we will someday behold. Second Peter, or in the second point, Peter confronts them with Jesus' death. After having mapped out this glory that Jesus has glorified in this incredible work of this instantaneous healing, Peter confronts them with Jesus' death. I heard some of you saying amen as Matt was reading, Pastor Matt was reading those verses that talk about, that talk about what they did. You see, Peter confronts them with Jesus' death. You handed him over to be killed. You disowned him before Pilate through, though he was had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life. First thing that we notice is that Peter puts Jesus' martyrdom squarely on their shoulders. They were not innocent. Peter is speaking to the hometown crowd here. They're at the temple. It's not a holiday in the sense of Pentecost or Passover. On the day of the Passover... Many people had come to Jerusalem. The streets would have been thronged with people who had come to Jerusalem. Many of them, maybe from distant places, who had never seen the miracles of Jesus. Maybe they'd never even heard him taught. They got caught up in the crowd. But the people at Jerusalem, the hometown folks, knew exactly about Jesus. They'd heard him teach over and over again at the temple. They'd seen miracle after miracle. They had heard the testimonies that had come back from other places where Jesus had preached and done miracles. So we're talking about the hometown crowd here who does not have an excuse. They had witnessed and seen the power and the compassion of Jesus. Even one of their own, one of their greatest leaders by the name of Nicodemus in the third chapter of the Gospel of John said, we know of Jesus, said to Jesus, we know that you are a man sent from God because no one could do the things you're doing unless he was sent from God. Now that's a little paraphrase of that, but look it up. No, he puts it squarely upon them. You were participants in Jesus' death. You handed him over. There's no denial of culpability in this martyrdom of Jesus. The blame squarely comes to you. You betrayed Jesus, secondly, to a pagan leader. They had betrayed Jesus over to Pilate, a wicked, 
a wicked ruler of Rome, from Rome. The irony is that Pilate saw this whole process as a gross miscarriage of justice. He even went to bat for Jesus. He wanted to let Jesus go. And all you have to do is read back through that narrative. Peter is helping them to, to understand their guilt. Every one of us has to understand that we are sinners and need the grace of Jesus Christ. Paul, Peter is pointing to their need of a Savior. You, you, you participated in the killing. Romans 3.23, how many of you know that verse? All have sinned and come short. Okay, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. How many of you know verse 24? Come on, Fred. It goes on to say, and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. All we are sinners. We are all sinners. Sometimes we don't think we're sinners. That's because we've got a poor memory. We don't want to remember the rotten things we've done. We don't want to own our failures. We choose just not to think about them. Let's face it. Only those who see themselves as sinners will recognize, will recognize their need for a Savior, for a rescuer of their souls. We need to understand that. Now, I, want you to, I don't want you to focus on your past. You know, we can get up here. You remember how rotten a sinner you were? Paul, Paul's pointing out, you guys, or Peter's pointing out, you guys sinned. You failed Jesus. You should have known better. But I want to take you to another event in your life. Not all your past failure, but do you remember that moment? Do you remember that moment when all that sin that had you weighed down? Do you remember that, that crippling load of sin that you carried? Don't go through that whole litany of what it was and lose this moment. But do you remember when you were loaded down with the with all the sin in your life, and Jesus lifted it off of you. When the power of his saving grace set you free, that ought to be a hallelujah moment. A hallelujah moment that celebrated how the giver of life had really given you true life and forgiveness. He said, yet you asked for a murderer to be released. You traded the giver of life for a taker of life. One who was steep in his evil of his own master john 8 44 says you belong to a description of those who follow satan he says you belong to your father the devil and you want to carry out your father's desires he was a murderer from the beginning not holding to the truth there's no truth in him when he lies he speaks his native language he is a liar and the father of lies you traded the innocent the perfect the giver of life for a murderer a taker of life you disowned the holy and righteous one and ask a murder to be released to you the word holy there we, we, we talk about this a lot someone is holy who is set apart it's agios it's a technical term that would talk about even the uh, stuff in the temple, all the furniture and all the bowls, they were agios, they were set apart. But God uses that for us, that we are to be set apart. We are to be different from the rest of the world, set apart for Christ, holy by nature. Jesus was holy by nature and was separated to do the will of God his Father. He left everything. Philippians 2 tells us, that he left everything. We are not holy by nature. We are not holy by nature. We fail. We sin. But we have one who is holy. Israel's rejection of Jesus is beyond belief and excuse. That decision placed them in open rebellion to the will of God. He goes on to say, not only did you trade the holy one, you traded the righteous one. Innocent of crime, in right standing, how bad was this? How bad of injustice was this? Pilate's wife recognized that Jesus was who he was, that he is the God, the Savior. He says, while Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him a message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man. 
for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. <laughs> Men, it pays to listen to your wife. <laughs> Women, I was expecting a lot more out of you at that point. Let me say that one more time. Men, it pays to listen to your wife. Pretty weak still. Now, you, you get it, this, this woman, we don't have any record that she's saved. She recognizes God gives her a dream. What you're doing is wrong, Pilate. Don't do this. <laughs> On the day that Jesus was betrayed... They took him to a hill called Golgotha. There they pounded the nails in his wrists, in his feet. And they mocked him, they spit upon him. They hoisted him up, they dropped that cross in the hole. And even while he was on that cross, he continued to minister, caring for those. And there stood a Roman centurion and the centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. Verse 16 of our text summarizes the basis of this healing. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is the Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has given this complete healing to him as you can all see. See, it all comes down to the healing power of Jesus. And I wonder how many of us are giving testimony to that power. How many of us are talking about that on a daily basis to people. The third thing we observe is Peter's calls to repent. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Uh, first thing, he says, you acted in ignorance, but God overruled you. Luke 23, 34 says, Jesus on the cross says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes and cast lots. In 1 Corinthians 2, 8, it says, None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. They were ignorant in what they were doing. They didn't understand the totality of what they were doing. Jesus understands and has compassion on us in our state of fallenness. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 through 6 says, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let the light shine out of the darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. See, God not only overruled what they did, he resurrected his son, but now the light of his son is shining in our hearts to illuminate us, to show us what we need to do. God has not only resurrected him, but he now shines in our hearts. Acts 3, 19 through 21, in our going back to our text, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Christ who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. He must remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. Repent and turn to God. The word here, repent, means to change one's mind or purpose. It is a change of the mind that is issued out in the change of behavior. It's just not, I change my mind about Jesus, but my whole life is transformed. I am changed to be like Christ, to lift up his name. So, he says, repent that your sins may be wiped out. Psalms 51, 9 through 12 says, 
Hide your face from my sin and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Just restore to me the joy of my salvation. Grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Forgiveness and the wiping of the slate clear. That's what God wants to do for every one of us. That we can have that through our great sin bearer, Jesus, the one who carries our load. All we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. What does the scripture says? And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. When is the last time you spoke to someone about the redemptive, reconciling power of Christ? When was the last time? Are you cultivating an, a heart that looks for that moment that you can plug a piece of the truth in? I had a salesman at our house this past week. I bought something, and he was over, and we were doing up the contracts. I'm sitting on the front porch with him, and the Lord is saying to me, y you need to talk to this guy. And I said, okay. So as he's talking, I, he asked me, you know, questions to put on the contract and he, he knew that I was the minister down here and uh, I said to him do you go to church anywhere oh yeah 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 I go to such and such a church I said great 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 well that's all well and good but that doesn't mean he's a Christian all right just because you go to church doesn't make you a Christian so I said to him I said after a period of time, the Holy Spirit's still speaking. I said, have you ever given your heart to Christ? This young man looked at me. He said, oh, yes. And it opened a door. And he said, he says, my life was such a mess. And he said, then I met my wife. She started taking me to church. I thought, oh, here's Wayne Eckes' testimony all over again. He said, she started taking me to church. And he said, a year ago, I gave my heart to Jesus Christ. <laughs> I just wanted to shout. Because the reality was, I needed to ask him, and he needed to tell me what had changed his life. He had repented. He had turned. He said, oh, my life is so different now. I said, thank God. He says, not only will your sins be wiped away, the slate cleared, but there'll be times of refreshing. God has a set time for everything. And there is a time coming when God is going to change everything. When Christ comes, the old will be gone, the new will come, everything will be made over again, it'll all be destroyed and made, but there is going to be a new way of life. <laughs> Isaiah captures it in the 11th chapter. The, the wolf will lie with the lamb, and the leper will lie down with the goat, and the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, and their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. <laughs> oh, that that day of restoration would come when we could see life as it was meant to be lived. Right now, we just got a blurry vision of the possibilities. But let me tell you something else. When you have your slate cleaned, the sins are wiped away, there comes a time of refreshing. And I don't know about you, but I have those times of refreshing on a regular basis where I am with the Lord and he is speaking to my heart, showing me truth and refreshing my soul. Yes, there is an ultimate time when Christ is going to make everything new. But praise God, we have those moments even here in a fallen world. We can have those times of refreshing. And then thirdly, not only is it a time when the slate is clean, when there will be times of refreshing, but it will be at the time of Christ's return. As I thought about how I did in that last moment, that last point, I remembered Revelation, the 19th chapter, says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse. 
whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire. On his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood. His name is the word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses, dressed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth comes a sharp sword which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has the name written. Would you say it with me? King of kings and Lord of lords. Let's say it again. King of kings and Lord of lords. We live in a world of great dysfunction right now. And there's no greater message the world needs to hear than the reconciling, forgiving truth of Jesus Christ. If there is a day and age in which we need to stand up and shout it from the rooftops, he is the one who gives equality. He is the one who gives forgiveness. He is the one who brings reconciliation. He is our great burden bearer, our great forgiver of our sins. We need to rejoice in that every day, shouting it from the rooftops. Let's stand. I've chosen a closing hymn for us today. I want to get back to singing as we leave. But it's an old song that has spoken to my heart for years. And if God is speaking to your heart, maybe you just need a, to repent and turn to Christ. Maybe you've never received him as your personal Savior. You've been going to church and you look good to everybody else, but you know inside your heart's not right with God. I want to ask you to come and pray. Maybe you've just lost that zeal for life and you need a refreshing. Sing with me. <clears throat> just as I am without one plea but that thy blood was shed for me and that thou bidst me come to thee O Lamb of God I come come Just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot, O Lamb of God. to talk to all of you and particularly you who are watching us on simulcast you know if God is speaking to your heart I encourage you to get alone with him today spend some time asking him to renew your heart give you a greater vision to speak up the truth of Christ our nation needs godly people who will stand up for the name of Jesus if we're depending upon politicians to straighten this country out, we're sadly mistaken. It won't happen. It can happen through a revival, through men and women giving their heart to Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? Would you rededicate yourself today to a greater witness for Christ? Fathers, we leave here today. Let us go with the awareness that you're with us and that we are a part of your great redemptive process. And someday, that last grain of sand will fall through that hourglass, and you will come in the twinkling of an eye, brighter than any lightning, and you're going to show up, and it will be the end. 
and we'll be able to come home with you. But Lord, until that day, help us to grab everybody we can and bring them with us by telling them the good news of Jesus, calling them to a salvation. Lord, we believe that every man, woman, or child who confesses the name of Jesus Christ is saved. And we pray, Lord God, that we would rejoice in that hope that can be there for any man, woman, or child who will call on your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.